we looked for a specific country partner. And because the United States and China uh, each account for a disproportionate amount of greenhouse gas emissions, and because the US government had a program that they began in 2008 to cooperate with China on lowering carbon emissions, that's where we chose to begin. So the overview of the talk I will give today, uh, it's divided into four sections. The first is uh, just identifying the challenge, which I think most of you are already quite familiar with. Uh, two, to go over the assumptions that went into the design and implementation of the program that I will be introducing. Third is a quick overview of the program itself. And then fourth, some very brief concluding remarks. So for the challenge, the uh, global scientific consensus, most prominently supported by the work of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, assesses with high confidence a global warming increase of 1% centigrade as measured against pre-industrial levels. In other words, that, um, uh, that warming increase has already happened and is in the rear view mirror. Currently experienced effects from one degree centigrade global warming, uh, which have already occurred, include the loss of sea ice and glacial shrinking, accelerated sea level rises, shifting atmospheric uh, and oceanic currents, longer and more intense heat waves and hurricane seasons, which uh, as many of you know, we're experiencing two of these long predicted effects right now in North America, a uh, unusual hurricane activity in the Southeast of the country and uh, fires, unlike unprecedented fires throughout the West Coast. Uh, impacts on the biosphere include the shifting of plant and animal ranges, earlier plant and tree flowering and rapid declines in biodiversity all of these changes threaten the equilibrium of the planet and more fundamentally the continued viability of human adaptation to the planet. I want to not belabor this point, but to cite findings from a, the most recent assessment of the national security impacts of these changes in the United States. And the reason I think this, it's important to take a moment to do this is that although our current president is well known as being a climate change denier, the administration, even under the leadership of a climate change denier, um, is very clear on these real risks and real national security challenges that the change in climate is causing to the United States. So uh, I'm gonna read out three, four, five, seven bullet points, which are direct quotes from the most recent assessment of national security impacts uh, issued just a, a year ago by the Trump administration. Quote, climate change creates new risks and exacerbates existing vulnerabilities in communities across the United States, presenting growing challenges to human health and safety, quality of life, and the rate of economic growth. Quote, without substantial and sustained global mitigation and regional adaptation efforts, climate change is expected to cause growing losses to American infrastructure and property and impede the rate of economic growth over this century. Quote, the quality and quantity of water available for use by people and ecosystems across the country are being affected by climate change, increasing risks and costs to agriculture, energy production, industry, recreation, and the environment. Quote, impacts from climate change on extreme weather and climate related events, air quality, and the transmission of disease through insects and pests food and water increasingly threaten the health and well-being of the American people. 
particularly populations that are already vulnerable. Quote, ecosystems and the benefits they provide to society are being altered by climate change, and these impacts are projected to continue. Without substantial and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions, transformative impacts on some ecosystems will occur. Some coral reef and sea ice ecosystems are already experiencing such transformational changes. Quote, rising temperatures, extreme heat, drought, wildfire on rangelands, and heavy downpours are expected to increasingly disrupt agricultural product productivity in the United States. Expected increases in challenges to livestock health, declines in crop yields and quality, and changes in extreme events in the United States and abroad threaten rural livelihoods, sustainable food security, and price stability. And finally, quote, our nation's aging and deteriorating infrastructure is further stressed by increases in heavy precipitation events, coastal flooding, heat, wildfire, and other extreme events, as well as changes to average precipitation and temperature. Without adaptation, climate change will continue to degrade infrastructure performance over the rest of the century, with the potential for cascading impacts that threaten our economy, national security, essential services, and health and well being. Uh, I'm well aware that most of the people on this call are not U.S. citizens, and the only reason that I took the time to go through that assessment of the very dramatic impacts on U.S. national security by an administration that uh, it, it, at the leadership level does not even acknowledge the uh, importance of climate change is to show that there is widespread um, concern within the government and 87% um, of American citizens feel that climate change is a uh, very important challenge and that there is man-made contribution to it. Uh, former Vice President Biden, who of course is going against President Trump in the November 3rd election, has pledged that he would join the Paris Accord on day one. And um, the US notice to withdraw from the Paris Accord does not actually take place until after the November 3rd election. Uh, with that, I would like to go to the next section of my presentation, which is, excuse me? I think that is Alexa talking to me. The next section is uh, the assumptions that went into our project design. And there are two types of assumptions that I'll introduce briefly. The first is conceptual level assumptions. Uh, there's what I call the PPP premise. Uh, I expect many of you know that PPP stands for Public-Private Partnership. Uh, by now, it's become axiomatic to recognize that governments do not and will not have the ability or resources to address the climate change challenge on their own. Meanwhile, individual involvement has increased impressively, but faces its own limitations. Chief among these is the gnawing sense that individual action is somewhat powerless uh, in the face of such an intractable and complex challenge. While collective action provides positive direction in this dilemma, public-private partnerships are particularly effective because they bring together the key stakeholder groups, governments, businesses, NGOs, in organized collaborative frameworks of action. Put simply, the urgency of the climate change challenge requires the capabilities of all these major stakeholder groups to be brought together in concerted action. PPPs effectively mobilize all hands on deck. So for that reason, we committed at the outset to conduct our project and program on the basis of a PPP. 
Secondly, is the proud movers premise. The climate change challenge is global, but except for rare instances, such as exemplified by Greta Thunberg, it's generally not possible to move directly from individual action to global coordination. Uh, my organization's operating assumption was to try to align climate action in the US with climate action in China, since these two countries were the leading protagonists on the global climate change stage. There was a basis for believing that there was a role for subnational activity. And by subnational, I mean that we began as a city to city level effort, uh, my hometown, Philadelphia, with our sister city in Tianjin, which is about 30 minutes to the southeast of Beijing by high speed uh, rail. And we, as I will uh, be able to describe a little bit later, we have now expanded to a region to region cooperation from our initial city to city subnational cooperation. So uh, there was a basis for believing there was a role for subnational activity of this sort because the stage for it had recently been constructed by the two national governments in Beijing and Washington. Despite the fact that the US, um, as up until recently, the de facto leader of the world's developed nations and China as de facto leader of the developing nations had been at loggerheads over who would pay for climate action since the early 1990s, U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson and PRC Minister Wu Yi initiated a productive intergovernmental dialogue in the mid-2000s. This led to the announcement of joint action at the U.S. and Chinese governmental levels in late uh, 20, uh, 2008 by the George W. Bush administration and followed by the expansion of that action in early 2010 by the Obama administration. My organization was formed in 2011 with the express idea of stepping forward as a subnational actor on this binational stage, uh, which was known by its formal name, the 10 year framework of US China cooperation on energy and environment. Uh, we also built in a replicability and scalability premise. Uh, it was clear right from the outset of CPGP's effort, uh, that's my organization, that to achieve impact on this stage, it would have to come through innovating a solution that could be scaled quickly and easily replicated from locale to locale, particularly in China, where the need for environmental solutions is most critical. The need for scalable and replicable solutions reflects directly the exigencies of the 1.5 degree centigrade modeling curve, which we were looking at before. Um, put simply, progressing from um, the one degree change that has already occurred, if we can stabilize it at 1.5, um, we are hopefully going to be in a a kind of sustainable range for economic growth. But if we allow that to get past 1.5 degrees centigrade to the two degree level, um, we are really triggering a domino effect of um, changes that uh, may prove more than we can sustainably manage. <clears throat> and so, um, the need for scalability and replicability was built in as, as a foundational element of both the 10 year framework, which is the stage we're operating on and our own program. The ability to achieve speed and scale in China was not something which uh, my organization could hope to deliver without identifying and partnering with the right Chinese counterpart. And uh, there's a longish story of how that happened, but to uh, keep things simple for our purposes here, uh, we partnered with the leading uh, economic and technological um, development zone uh, in our sister city, which is called Tianjin. There are 219 of these zones throughout China and TIDA, or the Tianjin Economic Technological Development Area, is perennially ranked number one among them. The final assumption we built in was 
the multi-level premise. Um, at the outset of our effort, we adjusted for the fact that there is sometimes a startling amount of disconnection between different levels of government, at least here in the US. Uh, counties, municipalities, and states in the greater Philadelphia region all share a common objective to export more clean energy products and services to the world and to China uh, and to attract more investment from the world and China to help grow their capabilities in their own local economies. But more often than not, their ability to coordinate and collaborate is um, limited. So uh, China Partnership, recognizing this, chose to adopt a multi-level model so that we could potentially uh, have uh, something to say uh, and to build a relationship with each of these levels. And we would be uh, essentially supplying the coordinating glue. So uh, our multi-level approach really goes from the individual citizen up to the United Nations and its sustainable development goals. In addition to these um, conceptual premises, I'll go through these a little bit more quickly uh, just to keep this moving along, but there are also four practical premises that we built into our program. The first is the cultural bridging premise. It follows directly from the decision to work um, in both the US and China around a common climate action undertaking. Uh, it means that political, legal, and cultural gaps would need to be bridged in order for the effort to be effective. Um, we could talk about how we overcome those gaps at each of those three levels, but for now, let's just say that uh, the political gaps, the legal gaps, and the cultural gaps all need to be recognized and proactively addressed. The second risk, the second premise is the political risk mitigation uh, risk. I'll leave this um, by simply saying that the United States and China have a very long history. This is a point that's really particular to US experience, and I know that most of the audience is international, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the uh, U.S. history of engagement with China going back into the 1700s when the first trading ship w went to China uh, has alternated between uh, kind of a love and hate uh, relationship. And that reflects political currents in the United States as well as political uh, realities in China. I won't spend any more time on this other than to say that we, when we entered into this program back in 2011, we recognized and kind of built in uh, shock absorbers for the possibility that the relationship with China would turn negative. And that is in fact what has happened since 2016. Uh, we've been able to survive that because we built in an, uh, kind of a risk mitigation premise from the beginning. There's also the resiliency premise. Um, <clears throat> there was no quick and easy roadmap for CPGP to refer to in building this program with China. We knew we'd be forging our own path and that it would be arduous and probably a very long journey. But we knew there would be value in showing that the path could be traveled um, and we hope to encourage others to follow by making our model available. With other municipalities um, following in our footsteps, a faint path can become a well-traveled path. Our sense of the uh, challenge was not, on tar was not off target. We actually had a existential challenge in the first two or three years of our program, and we needed to entirely re-engineer our model to um, uh, give it a chance to work. Uh, our initial model um, failed spectacularly because of a IPR uh, problem that occurred in China. 
And then finally for this section, there is the inclusivity uh, regeneration premise. Uh, our public-private partnership is at two levels with the city of Philadelphia government, specifically the Department of Commerce, and with the US federal government, specifically the Departments of Energy and the Department of State. This dual level PPP functions as an open and inclusive platform for local government, businesses, universities, industry associations, and other nonprofits to collaborate towards a shared purpose. For our common purpose of climate action to scale, a sustainability approach is not enough. Sustainability is really just holding on, maintaining. What is needed to thrive is a regenerative approach. Inspired by natural systems, such as physiology and ecology, regenerative models are increasingly being applied to business settings as a step level improvement over traditional sustainability models. For CPGP's effort to take root at scale and speed, it has to have this humanistic uh, humanistically powered organic growth uh, potential and it has to be able to attract the talents and energies from all age groups and works of life to or organically foster its growth. So this uh, photo was from 2014. I will use it to introduce our program. This was when my organization was formally inducted into the uh, competitively selected uh, process to become a US-China eco-partner. Um, some of these faces may be recognizable to my international friends on this conference or this virtual conference. In dead center in the front row is the former Secretary of State John Kerry. To uh, our left of him is the um, former uh, senator from Montana, but then the ambassador to China, uh, Max Baucus. And uh, to his left uh, is John Podesta, who some of you may know because it was his emails which were hacked in the 2016 election which caused so much difficulty for the Clinton campaign uh, and in the final days of that campaign. Uh, John Podesta was uh, presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. Uh, behind them, uh, my hair a little bit disheveled, is uh, me. So, um, I'm gonna tell quickly the story of our eco-partnership and how it has evolved over the past few years and what we plan to do next. I'll go quickly through this because as I mentioned at the outset, it, it's not our story, our particular song that we're singing that's important. What is important is how some of these basic elements like public-private partnership, innovation, collaboration uh, operate like cords that can be put together to produce many different songs. So um, China Partnership has innovated an open platform among businesses, local governments, and nonprofits to bring an array of US low carbon energy solutions to national level, <coughs> excuse me, Uh, to bring these U.S. low carbon energy solutions to national level industrial park users in China. Uh, we call our platform the Be Better platform. The B-E in Be Better stands for build environment. And the three dimensions of better are more energy efficient, smarter, involving IoT connectivity and uh, good IoT security, 
And for industrial users in these industrial parks, the second dimension of smarter refers to cleaner and smarter manufacturing processes. And then finally, and quite importantly, is the health dimension. Uh, energy efficiency benefits tend to accrue to the owner of a building, but it's important uh, and has been dramatically shown during COVID that the health of occupants is um, intimately connected to the design and operation of buildings. So as far as COVID is concerned, the physical spacing requirements, but also for more general health, uh, instead of situating elevators right at the entrance and putting staircases uh, in kind of ugly concrete columns in the corner of a building, if you make a dramatic uh, and attractive staircase that gives wonderful views as you climb the staircase, it incentivizes people to take healthier options while they're occupying the building. What's the scope? Uh, while the Be Better program is potentially applicable across the full spectrum of building types, which as I mentioned before, account for about 40% of carbon emissions in China and the, and the US. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we're focusing on industrial park applications in China, primarily because our TIDA partner provides privileged access to the entire network of 36 best and brightest uh, industrial parks. That's a group known as the Green Development League. And our partner TIDA is the secretary general for that league of 36 of the best and brightest NEPDZs. But it also provides access to the entire network of 219 NEPDZs throughout China. Uh, I mentioned before that we kind of had an existential challenge in the years 2015-2016. Um, because this relates more to our program experience in this binational U.S.-China program, I won't take up our time with um, telling you about that problem, but if anyone is interested to know, you could ask in the Q&A section and I will be happy to share that. I mentioned that we have over the past six years started to progress from being a city to city cooperation to being a region to region cooperation. Um, to clearly define the geography of this new region to region phase of our eco partnership my organization drew on our past program experience. Previously, CPGP had developed the program to help local government partners attract inbound foreign direct investment from China. And this investment attraction program used uh, three, it's like a, a bullseye with uh, the black target in the middle, surrounded by a white, uh, ring and then surrounded by a bigger yellow ring. Uh, at the heart of our investment attraction program was the 11 county tri state greater Philadelphia region, which we refer to as PHL. The same thing that'll be on your luggage tag if you fly through Philadelphia International Airport. Um, but it also involved two progressively larger rings in its scope. Uh, the middle ring was the three state geography of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the state of New Jersey and Delaware. And the biggest ring was the mid-Atlantic region shown on this map, comprising the six states of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, as well as the District of Columbia. And it is this outer six states plus one district region that we chose to define our U.S. regional area for uh, our region-to-region -region Be Better program. 
In China, we identified our counterpart region on the basis of President Xi's signature plan for the consolidated development of Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei province, which um, in China is most frequently referred to as the Jingjingji region. Uh, Jin coming from the second syllable or the second character in the name of Beijing, meaning capital. Jin coming from the second character in Tianjin's name. And Ji being a classical name that referred to uh, what is now Hebei province. Uh, in this slide, we've I did, we've labeled the three net DZs that, that again stands for the national level economic technological development zones uh, in the Jingjingji region, as well as to the bottom left, uh, uh, Shong'an New Area. This is a pet project of Xi Jinping's. Uh, for those of you who are a bit familiar with China, uh, the scale of Shong'an is uh, expected to be larger than either Shenzhen in the south or Pudong across the river from uh, Shanghai proper. Um, and it represents in China's new industrial development model that is more uh, ecological and socially inclusive. Uh, to give you a quick idea of the scale of our TIDA partner, their geographic footprint is larger than the county of Philadelphia, and they have more than 150 Fortune 500 companies that are manufacturing on their premises. Um, we are also, as we build out our region to region Be Better program, we're simultaneously positioning for the possibility of um, resolution of trade tensions and the ability from our organization to move forward with an opportunity that we were given in early 2016 before the interruption of that opportunity because of uh, the Trump administration's uh, tariff um, actions against China. Uh, again, I won't go into this in, in great depth, but the opportunity was for my organization to work with that group of 36 um, uh, leading industrial parks and the Green Development League to create a, to, to plan for a Sino-US eco park at, a, at the national level. Uh, the Green Development League will be the key partner to this national level effort if it comes to fruition. As I've said, we've already been appointed as the sole US-based member of the working group for planning that uh, park. There, there are, let me just see if I have these statistics here. Um, yeah, the opportunity that we were given was to be the 10th in a program that's run by China's Ministry of Commerce to create China and then foreign country partner eco parks uh, and GDL is the, the host for that activity in China. Uh, so if we are able to get through the trade tensions and pick up that opportunity again, we will be working alongside uh, nine other similar international eco parks that are already functioning in China under the Ministry of commerce's auspices. These represent mostly Sino-European collaborations. There are two Sino-Italy eco-parks currently. There's a Sino-Swiss eco-park and a Sino-Finland eco-park. Uh, the most developed and successful is a Sino-German eco-park, which is in the port city of Dalian. Uh, it, it focuses on green maritime technology and it is already uh, finalized $3 billion US of um, contracts that are either under construction or have been completed. Um, what's next for us? Um, 
I'll go through this very quickly because this really is just the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. And the more important focus in my presentation today is just what the potential for bringing environmental solutions uh, at scale and speed might be. But uh, to tip through these quickly, uh, we have entered into a strategic alliance with an economic metric modeling company. Um, and that is important because our partner organizations for realizing this opportunity are the member companies of industry associations. And we need an econometric modeling partner to excite and help the member companies in those partner industry associations uh, recognize and understand the potential of what our program uh, presents. <clears throat> We've also partnered with Penn State through a program that uh, was started by the UN and is now headquartered uh, with Penn State. And Penn State has a campus in Philadelphia at our Navy Yard. Uh, the name of that UN uh, group, which Penn State is um, essentially the, the lead organization in is the Global Buildings Network. That may be of interest to uh, some of you because the, it's a very new UN effort. Uh, it is headed by a Kenyan woman who is extremely competent and uh, fun to work with named East Esther Obanyo. And if you want to contact me through the chat function, uh, I'm sure she would be delighted to learn of any interest from any of your uh, countries to uh, learn more about and explore collaboration in the Global Buildings Network. These are the six industry associations that we partner with. Um, uh, in the previous presentation, there was mention of the Green Building Council. We work at our tier one level for energy efficiency with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. These are the locations of the 36 best and brightest industrial parks in China, the so-called Green Development League. And we are participating in a competition that they've offered this year. And these are funding sources um, that we currently have an application in place with the MacArthur Foundation. And we are readying grant applications for the Energy Foundation and Blue Clerk philanthropies. Uh, there was one other, uh, I, I meant to mention that both the presentation that I just showed you and this presentation that is teed up here, which I am really not going to show you in the interest of time, were both given this week, uh, Thursday and Friday, at the annual conference for the US-China Eco-Partnership Program. This second presentation, as the title suggests, is just some practical advice of how to work with industry associations to amplify the impact of what a small organization like mine is doing. Uh, these again are the industry association partnerships that we are keying on. There are clearly advantages of working with industry associations. They command industry knowledge. They're respected as authorities in their field. And through their member companies, they have uh, complete reach with all of the companies or most of the companies that one would want to deal with in any of these industry areas. There are challenges in dealing with them because you have to convince them of the uh, value of the proposal that you are bringing to them. It's not top-down decision-making by a CEO. As, a, as member organizations, their decision-making tends to be a little bit complicated because they need to consult with their member companies. And because the world is changing so fast and um, it requires effort to keep their attention 
uh, in a world of a limited attention span. One practical way of doing this is by focusing on grant support because everyone needs money. And also we provide essentially the communication tool that makes it possible for them with very high efficiency to uh, get the word out to their member companies about what the opportunity is. We organize a webcast, we organize a webinar where we will essentially make our pitch to uh, six to 10 key decision makers in the industry association and then we equip them with a webcast. The webinar is highly interactive. The webcast is pretty much a canned product. Uh, they can then share the webcast throughout their entire membership and then collect the names of those companies that want to learn more. And then we can give a webinar presentation to those uh, interested companies and we try to get uh, their formal sign on to join our program. Uh, this is maybe a small point, but we haven't tried to talk to all six industry associations simultaneously. That's a little bit complicated. We've staged our um, outreach. Uh, so we have two that are already established, two that we are in the process of establishing, and two that we haven't started on yet. But obviously, the, when you're able to demonstrate that you have two that are already on board, it's easier to uh, get the next two on board. That's the end of that second presentation. And my concluding remarks are very brief. Um, I simply want to share that the bedrock lesson from the six years of eco-partnership experience we've had um, is that the real potential is not in studying our program, but rather in focusing on the fundamental elements that made our uh, model possible. Um, and those, as I previously mentioned, are public-private partnerships, uh, uh, an innovative approach to analyzing where your organization can make the greatest impact. And then finally, collaboration. In our case, it was collaboration with industry associations. In your case, the collaboration might be different. Uh, there are as many ways to undertake uh, your version of this as there are people willing to catalyze the effort the CPG case study is used here only as a practical, concrete illustration of how the three chords of PPP structure, innovation, and collaboration can be put together to produce a particular song, but those same three chords can generate countless other songs. Uh, we are not suggesting that an impactful effort needs to connect through various levels the way ours does with community well, actually individual community, city, county, region, national, and binational. Uh, we're not suggesting that it needs to combine the individual with the global community the way that ours undertakes to do. We, we're just trying to present a logic for why we've done what we've done and in the hope that some of our experience may possibly be helpful for you. Um, and with that, uh, I will conclude and ask if there are any questions.